thank you all for coming. Thank you very much. I'm going to take very little of your time. My name is Chase Robinson. I'm president of the Graduate Center. My tenure at the Graduate Center, I was provost before I was president, more or less coincides exactly with the establishment and the maturation and the, the, uh, the glorious accomplishments that um, the Leon Levy Center for Biography um, has, uh, has realized. Um, I will let our uh, illustrious director, um, for whom uh, only the most uh, genuine of praise is appropriate, um, uh, get things um, kind of off the ground in a more substantive way. But I didn't want to um, miss the opportunity to, to welcome you all, many of you former fellows, welcoming you back to the Graduate Center, many of you uh, colleagues from the Leon Levy Foundation, to whom we are deeply grateful. Of course, Shelby herself, uh, whose vision really lies behind the center, um, and, and to whom we are we're all collectively very grateful. Um, so welcome back. Thank you for coming. Um, I've only been insulted once during this uh, cocktail party when I was told, well, this is much better than in previous years. And I said, why? And the person said, it's not taking place in your office. <laughs> um, so welcome to this more capacious, this more salubrious environment. Um, um, it's, it, 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 I must say, it does beat my office. My office does not have this view. Kai, thank you very much, and welcome to the podium. Kai Bird. Thank you, Chase. Um, the, the, we don't have a formal program here. This is really just a party, and it, it originated because I got some emails from some former fellows complaining that we never got them together again. We, we, they felt ignored. And so I promised I'd put on a party. <laughs> so this is it. <laughs> um, and <I've, clears throat> but it's also a, a nice occasion. It's, we're going on now our 11th year for the Biography Center. And uh, it's all due to Shelby and, of course, CUNY, who provides some support and space and administrative uh, support. Uh, <clears throat> and it all, this all adds to our mission, which is to explain and sell rigorous biography to the academy. And these fellows, well, there are now 40 of them, a little more. Um, we're going to have 44 starting in September. Uh, they are our missionaries. And uh, they've now published over 20 books out of you know, in the last 10 years. And there, that means that there are a little less than 18 or 19 or so who are still at it. Biography takes a long time. Anyway, uh, I've, I've only been here a year ago, and I wanted to make note of the fact that when, <clears throat> when I was recruited by Chase and Shelby, I had to confess to David Nassau, who was interrogating me, that you know I hadn't had a job since 1982. <laughs> I'd been a biographer all those years. And uh, so I just want to thank everyone for sort of taking a chance on me. Um, but it's been a terrific year. I've had a lot of fun. And it's opened up you know, New York City to me and, and meeting all these fabulous intellectuals, biographers included. Uh, <laughs> and I, I, I also say it, it's, the work has been, uh, really a breeze, in part because of my associate director, Thad Zilkowski, and he's made it, he makes everything happen. Um, I also am reminded that when I was recruited, Chase said that he really had one thing that he wanted me to focus on, and that was to try to explore this old idea that had been kicking around for several years of trying to start a master's program in biography. 
And we now have a proposal that has wound its way through several committees and won approval. And it seems like it's on track so that starting in the autumn of 2019, we may actually welcome the first class of uh, biographers in a two-year master's program where they'll get a degree in biography. And I think this is an enormous step forward and very exciting. And uh, uh, it will advance the cause of biography in many ways. But we're here also this evening just to honor the past, current, and future biographers. And we have, I think, at least two fellows who are going to be here next year. Um, but to also honor the, the fellows who have been here in the past and, and more, most particularly those who have recently published books, Justin Spring on the Gourmand's Way, Michael Massing for Fatal Discord, Ruth Franklin for Shirley Jackson, Alexander Chazen for Assassin of Youth, Jed Pearl for Alexander Calder, and Vanda Kreft on William Fox. Um, I also want to mention our current crop of fellows, Bruce Weber, who's working on E.L. Doctorow, Eleanor Randolph on Michael Bloomberg, Justin Gifford on Eldridge Cleaver, Lindsay Whalen on Mary Oliver, and Mickey Kaufman on Henry Kissinger. Uh, next year's fellows include Samantha Subramanian on the British biologist J.B.S. Haldane. He, Samantha actually stopped by and had lunch a couple of weeks ago, but he lives in Ireland. He's moving to New York in September. Uh, Jennifer Homans is working on George Balanchine, Rebecca Donner on Mildred Harnack, and Stephen Heyman is working on Lewis Bromfield. And I think Stephen is here from the corner. Um, after I finish, Stacy Schiff is going to make a few remarks about the difficulty of biography. Um, but I wanted to tell you, sort of by way of introduction, a sort of a personal story from my own research on my own biography of Jimmy Carter that I'm working on now, um, which will give you an idea of, of the, the problems and, and and the fun of this profession. Um, I was, oh, this was last December, I picked up the phone and called a rather obscure Carter source, a guy who had worked in the Carter administration for two years as a speechwriter. And he's now in his 80s, and we had a phone interview. I spent 45 minutes on the phone with him. He kept trying to tell me anecdotes and stories, but he, he wasn't a great storyteller, at least on the phone. And, uh, but I kept at it and pushed him. And, and uh, finally, after 45 minutes, I gave up. And I said, well, I'm not really getting much out of this guy. But I, I ended politely by saying, well, Jerry, you know, um, this has been terrific, but if uh, after we finish, you think of anything else you want to tell me, give me a call back. And by the way, if you, you know, find anything in your closets or your attic <laughs> in the way of papers related to your time in the Carter administration, please think of me. There's a long pause and he says, well, actually, you know, I have a diary. <laughs> 45 minutes into the conversation, he finally confesses that he has a diary. And I say, oh, well, uh, what kind of a diary is it? Is it about your, your whole life? And he says, no, no, it's just from the two years in the Carter White House. <laughs> so I say, well, is it handwritten or typed? And he says, oh, I typed it. <laughs> so I said, well, could I see it? <laughs> and he says, well, I don't know. It's, it's hard to copy. I don't think I can, it's on this onion skin type paper, you know, I don't think I can easily copy it. Why don't I just ship it to you? <laughs> and, so the diary actually arrives a few days later, FedEx, at his cost. 
And uh, it's, you know, that thick, two years, and it's really quite amazing. It, it's colorful, insightful, opinionated, and I spent the next month weeding in stories from from that diary into my narrative. It's just, and so I just want to emphasize with this story that biography can be damn fun. It's a treasure hunt. It's grinding, it takes forever, but it's a lot of fun. Um, and before I turn it over to Stacy, I, I have to mention Justin who's sitting here in the front row. Justin's a current fellow working at Eldridge Cleaver. And he has had a lot of fun this year. He's just come back from a two-month, six-week trip to Paris and Morocco and Atlanta, Georgia, and Washington, D.C. He persuaded Eldridge Cleaver's son, who's living in Mecca, works as a beekeeper in Mecca, I think, and he persuaded him to meet him because Justin is not a Muslim, so he can't go to Mecca. So he persuaded him with an air ticket to meet him in Morocco, spent four days with him. Uh, this led to Eldridge Cleaver's uh, widow, ex-wife, uh, inviting him to come down to Atlanta where she said, I actually have a whole attic full of archives and boxes. And Justin was living in the attic the last week. <laughs> and it, it, this is going to, you know, this is going to make his book. It's very exciting. It's wonderful material. And it wouldn't have happened without his year here at the Levy Center. Anyway, on that note, I want to turn it over to Stacy, who's also had a few years in the archives and uh, she'll t tell a few stories from the trenches of the, of the world of biography. Stacy, thank you. Thanks, Kai. Um, Shelby, thank you for this amazing center. It's so, what we do is so incredibly profoundly solitary. It's just odd to see so many biographers together in the same room. It's like, you know, a convention of lighthouse keepers or something, you know, or beekeepers in Mecca, you know, other people who live completely solitary lives. Um, Kai asked me to speak um, about the travails of biography in five or six minutes. And that's like saying, like, could you write a short life of Winston Churchill? Um, no, but I could speak about the joys of biography in five or six minutes. So, so I, I, I'm gonna just tell one, one sort of quick tale that comes with a twist um, from the Nabokov years. Um, in 1937, um, early in the year, Nabokov leaves his wife and infant son in Berlin, where Hitler has come to power, and goes to Paris to try to make a living and to try to figure out a way to get the family out of Germany. He leaves in January, and in the next four months, he and Vera essentially write each other pretty much every day letters which, from his end, tend to sound like, um, I'm the toast of the town, everyone's reading me, um, I've been to so-and-so salon followed by so-and-so salon, and I only meet two kinds of women, the women who quote my prose back to me and the ones who ponder whether my eyes are yellow or green. <laughs> So you can imagine how reassuring these letters were to Vera, who very quickly and probably without the anonymous letter that helped her figure it out, realizes her husband is having a torrid affair in Paris while she's in Nazi Germany. Um, the affair plays itself out over those months. Finally, by the end of the summer, when the two of them are reunited in France, um, Nabokov will admit that he is in, as he puts it, the, the delicious days of adultery. Um, and um, he's that summer writing the first couple of chapters of The Gift, possibly his greatest novel, certainly the greatest novel in Russian, and the story Cloud Castle Lake. So of course, 60-ish years, almost 60 years later, in 1990, whatever it was, pre-internet and pre-cell phones, I had to find those letters, um, about which I knew from little squibs in various places. And it wasn't that hard to trace them back to a woman, to a Russian emigre in Paris, whose name was Tatiana Moritsov, who had been the confidant of the lover. The lover was a stunning, 
poodle groomer, um, who was also, <laughs> can't forget that detail, who was also a Russian emigre, um, who would go on, late when she was in her 60s, she would go on to write a story, a very deeply autobiographical story about the affair with Nabokov in which she quotes from the letter. So a lot of what I knew of the letters was from that story. Anyway, long story short, tracked down Tatiana Moritzov, who lived in a hovel in the 15th, um, with Russian icons on every possible surface. It was a you know, two by four apartment with enormous, this was the t a horrible detail, with the, uh, stashes of cat food in the bathtub, although she didn't have a cat, need I say more. Uh, it was pretty atrocious and she didn't have the letters anymore. She did have a diary. She had the, uh, the poodle grooming uh, lover's diary in which she had played hangman in Russian with Nabokov. It's a really stunning document. And she had a, another diary kept by the mother of the girlfriend, but she didn't have the letters. Because she had sold them several months earlier to a Russian collector whose name she was afraid to tell me because he was so powerful and threatening. So that started off um, brilliantly. Um, through an enormous number of circumstances, I tracked down said collector of the letters. And I was told that I could come to visit him if I agreed to come with an intermediary in a car that would pick me up in front of my apartment in Paris. But I was not to ask any questions or the identity of the, the person or where I was being taken. I didn't count on that when I went to biography school. <laughs> and I'm not really all that stout-hearted, so this was a little bit of a you know, gulp of a day for me. Anyway, went, went off to the outskirts of Paris, I don't know where, and through a lot of cigar smoke, we had this kind of non-negotiation about the letters. This actually took three meetings. The latter two were at the restaurant at the Plaza Athenee where I picked up the bill. That was about half my advance right there. And, and the upshot of it was that I could have the letters, which actually were sitting on the table frustratingly between us, on the condition that I was willing to pilfer from Dmitry Nabokov's archive some documents, some poems that said Russian wanted. You know, I don't know what you all would have done. This is where I wish I had been a Levy Fellow so I would know the answer to that question. But I didn't think that was really a deal I was willing to make. So I never saw the letters. And I don't know that to this day anyone has ever, in fact, seen those letters. But obviously I went on to write the book without them, um, using the little bits that I knew because they, were, they had turned up in Irina's diary and because she had worked them into this short story. Um, and I guess like my, the moral of the story here for me, for, for you all, is two things, and then there's a twist on this. First of all, I think now you understand why my next book was about Benjamin Franklin. Um, <laughs> there's no way I was going to do this again. I mean, I just like anxiety attacks in the middle of the night about the Russians. Um, and 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 secondly, you know, so you can sometimes, even if you don't have the the gems that you all seem to be plucking out of the closets, you can sometimes make it work. I mean, those letters may change the story, but I don't think they'll change it substantially. Um, we know a lot about how Nabokov felt and acted that summer. We know a lot about what went on between Vera and Vladimir trying to repair a relationship, and a lot of that makes its way into the novel, The Gift, which is you know, the reason why, you, why I wanted those letters in the first place. But the two twists are these. Um, at the end of the summer, when Nabokov realized he wasn't leaving his marriage or his wife, I mean, or his child, um, he wrote to Irina and said he'd like the letters back because each and every one of them was fiction. <laughs> so, um, needless to say, she didn't send the letters back, but I just loved that Nabokovian twist. Um, and years later, when um, a collection of his letters, of her husband's letters, was being compiled, Vera was asked to contribute a few letters, any few letters that were personal. And of course, the four that she picked were all adoring letters that date from those four months. So I just felt like that was like a preemptive strike on history there, just so that no one was ever gonna fish around in those months. Anyway, those, are the, those it seems to me, are the kinds of travails we face and the reasons why being together like this is so essential. Anyway, thank you.